Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Last time, we left off in the immediate aftermath of 25 ships belonging to the Grand Mughal and his family and certain other members of his court after that fleet slipped right past the six pirate ships that had been waiting in the Bab al-Mandeb Strait. It was nearly the end of August, 1695, and that fleet was getting away. This was a disaster for the pirates. The fortunes on which they planned to retire, maybe to settle down with a nice Malagasy girl, those fortunes were getting away from them. But it was a disaster for more than just the pirates. Make no mistake, there were other interested parties in this plunder as well. A voyage of this size with... Six different ships with 450 men and nearly 100 big guns. Well, that kind of thing just doesn't get slapped together out of thin air. These pirates had investors back in America. Those investors included some of the most important men in the North American English colonies. Governor Fletcher of New York. Then there were other governors and lieutenant governors and deputy governors from Massachusetts and Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania, not to mention other rich and powerful men in places like New York City, William Kidd, for example, Frederick Phillips, and all of the men who ran in his social circles. We haven't talked about this in some time, but I want you to remember that this entire voyage was predicated on a criminal conspiracy. The pirates themselves certainly had their own motivations, but the foundation of this voyage comes from a plot to circumvent the Royal Africa Company and establish a thriving slave market in New York independent of the company's monopoly. A plot that would require a ton of startup capital, and the pirates were supposed to be bringing that capital back to New York, and now all of that money that was expected was on its way to Surat leagues ahead of the pirates. The Mughal fleet had the wind in their sails, and the pirates would be hard-pressed if they were to catch them. But they were going to try. This is episode 219, Fatah Muhammad. The very first thing the pirates realized when they set out to the chase was that their months of waiting at sea had taken their toll on their little armada. Once they were all under sail, it became clear that the Dolphin, a brigantine of six guns and sixty men under Captain Richard Wunt, was far too slow to keep up. The crew transferred their guns and then themselves over to Henry Avery's Fancy. Now, I told you a couple of weeks ago that Fancy was at their strongest after taking on a French pirate crew. That was wrong. Since that time... They've taken on yet another small French pirate crew and that of the Dolphin. They were nearing, perhaps surpassing, 200 men. That was almost half the strength of the entire fleet. With that bit of business done, the pirates set Dolphin ablaze and opened up their own sails to give chase to the Mughal fleet. According to a one John Dan, one of the pirates on board Fancy, the Pearl, another of the ships in the fleet, was, quote, an ill sailor. Turned out she couldn't keep up either. But they didn't have the time or the space to unload her crew and guns. Instead, Fancy tossed out a rope and tied a tow line between herself and the Pearl. Pearl furled her own sails and was towed behind the Fancy. Now, I've told you more than a few times how fantastic a sailor the fancy was. How fast she was. But look at this. With 200 men, maybe more, on board, with a complement of, at this point, 52 guns, and now towing a 200-ton brigantine, when every ship in the fleet finally opened up their sails, fancy still outpaced Amity, under Thomas II, and Susanna, under Captain Thomas Wake. Both ships trailed behind the Amity and the Portsmouth Adventure under Captain Joseph Farrow, the only ship in the fleet left that could keep up with Fancy. Which was not ideal. They would want Amity and the Susanna when they finally caught up with the Mughal fleet, 
but it could have been worse. Fancy and Portsmouth Adventure were the largest ships in the fleet, plus they had a brigantine, the Pearl, attached. When they did catch the Mughal fleet, they could keep any ship there busy while the other two stragglers caught up. Then, together, they could strike. As ready as they would be, the Fancy, the Portsmouth Adventure, and the Pearl leaned into the chase. And I'm sure that this was a nail-biting affair for the pirates, but sea chases tend to take a long time. You know, they have the same winds, after all. Even with a ship as fine as the Fancy, they aren't a fast-paced car chase. So while the pirates are at the work of chasing down the Mughal fleet, let's take a moment to talk about what they could expect when they did catch up. The world of Islamic ship design is huge. Especially in the Mediterranean, there are hundreds of different types of ships sailed by Muslim sailors. In the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea, and to a lesser extent in Muslim Southeast Asia, there was one overwhelming ship type, the Tao. Essentially, that just means a Latin-rigged vessel, you know, the triangular sails as opposed to the square rig in the West. But just as there are dozens of types and classifications of square-rigged ships, there are dozens of different types of dhow. All the way from tiny little coastal skimmers and fishing boats, all the way up to massive, hulking warships. Nothing, though, that the Muslim world put to sea could compete with the largest ships that Europe did. You know, when we're talking about the capital ships, first-rate ships of the line, those were the biggest and most heavily armed ships in the world. The thing is, though, eastern shipping didn't really have to compete when it came to things like tonnage and guns. There's this distinction between the West and the East in terms of their philosophies of war. In the West, thanks to a myriad of ancient traditions, warfare often took on this character of like a a strong, bold line standing defiantly against the enemy. Think about Roman heavy infantry or, or a Viking shield wall or a wall of pikemen in the early modern world. Or the line of ships of the line. You know, they kind of stand there and say, well, come on, I dare you to attack me. But when they did attack, they did so in strength. They did so with with power. Think of a charge by medieval knights. We're talking about the heaviest cavalry in the world falling on your army and smashing it. In the East, though, things tended to be different. Often they were more subtle in their warfare. You've got these foot archers and hand cannoneers from places like China that were praying that you would line up your troops in a big wall of defiance. They would just rain down death on your big wall of defiance. And then you've got the horse archers like the Huns and the Mongols. Very fast and armed with bows, they could run in and take a bite and get out before any of your heavily armed knights would be able to respond. But in the cultural estuary of the Middle East, we see kind of a blending of these two styles of warfare. They definitely had quick and light units perfect for raiding and adept at guerrilla warfare. But when the time did come for a big decisive charge... Well, they might have a host of heavily armed cataphracts waiting to fall on your army. And that combination in styles translated to Muslim naval warfare as well. They had smaller Latin-rigged ships armed with swivel guns that were nimble. They could run in, take a bite, and get away before your giant first-rate ship of the line would be able to turn around and fire on them. But then they had a few really big Dow armed with big, heavy guns. Now, these were not as big or heavy as the biggest European ships, but they still got the job done. The type of ship that I'd like to make special note of today is called the Ganja Dow. 
You may remember this from Thomas II's first voyage to the region. The Ganja Dao was a big ship, not the biggest Dao out there, but still large. And it wasn't exactly a warship. Not a cargo freighter, either. It kind of reminds me of the East Indiamen employed by the East India Company. They were big enough to carry passengers and cargo and soldiers and guns. It was a kind of an all-purpose ship. But they were also traditionally beautiful. The ship's bow would have this ornate carved prow, decorated with spiral patterns and trefoil leaves. They were decorations not totally dissimilar to the mermaids you might see at the prow of a pirate ship. The rear of the ship, the stern, was almost always carved and decorated in even more ornate patterns. If you think of the rear end of a, uh, a galleon, it was very similar. In fact, that design on the galleon probably came from this dhow. And the cannon on board these ships, well, they were superb. There are modern Muslim scholars that will argue, with fairly convincing evidence, that the cannon was actually developed in Syria rather than China. The consensus still seems to be that China came first, and I'm not qualified to comment on that debate, but, you know, maybe it was Syria. They certainly had excellent bronze cannon in Damascus and Constantinople and Jerusalem really early on. Cannon that all throughout the Middle Ages and even up into the time with which we are concerned today rivaled and often surpassed the best cannon Europe could produce. And their small arms, well, this period in the Muslim world is defined by the three gunpowder empires. The Ottoman Empire, Safavid Persia, and Mughal India were all conquered with firearms. Now, it could be debated, but I think that the 17th century saw Europe surpass the Muslim world when it came to small arms designs. From about the time of the Thirty Years' War, continental guns just got better and better and more reliable and more accurate and more powerful. The flintlock designs that the pirates were using were probably some of the best designs in the world. Plus, pirates bought their own guns. You know, the army or the navy would supply you with a gun, but... The military was always looking to cut corners, cost-wise. One soldier's life tended to be worth less than the money they would save if, you know, a few guns failed to fire. But those guns would have to be the best in the world. When the pirates caught up with the Mughal fleet and they were closing in, those guns would be put to use. This was not some merchant ship out of Boston that was going to surrender their cod haul. No, they were going to fight with everything they had. The chase lasted for ten days. From the Gate of Tears, the pirates set out east into the Gulf of Aden and the Arabian Sea into fully open water. There wasn't a speck of land in sight, and for eight of those days the pirates saw neither land nor even a hint of the fleet. They were moving fast. It was monsoon season at this point, but that means that the Mughal fleet was also moving fast. On the ninth day out, one of the lookouts aboard the Fancy spotted land. And that was very, very bad. Take a look at a map of northwest India, and you'll notice a peninsula that juts out into the sea. It was that peninsula that the lookout had spotted. Were the pirates to sail around the peninsula, into the gulf between it and the rest of India, they would have found the city of Surat. And they would have died. Surat was the destination of the Mughal fleet. And it was the primary naval power base for the Mughal Empire. Now just down the coast was the city of Bombay. Today they call it Mumbai. But that, at the time, was the primary English naval power base in India. This entire region was a heavily militarized zone. There were gunships patrolling the waters and forts at every possible location. 
if the fleet had already made it into that bay towards Surat, they were home free. Still, though the pirates were unwilling to give up, they put their heads down and they sailed as hard as they could. They were going to do so until they could no longer sail on with any hope of survival. The following day, the tenth day of the chase, the 7th of September, 1695, still shy to the entrance of the gulf, the fancy spotted sails. There were maybe three or four craft on the horizon, most of them small, but one of them of a good size. Now, the pirates did not know to whom this ship belonged, and really most of the pirates that took part in this raid would probably go the rest of their lives without knowing that information, but... I do. His name was Abdul Jafar, and he was a singularly wealthy merchant in Mughal, India. He's one of those men that, when you call him a merchant, you're getting the wrong idea here. Frederick Phillips, for example, or even some of the wealthy nobles in England, well, they would have drooled over this guy's wealth and power. In Enemy of All Mankind, Stephen Johnson quotes one of Jafar's contemporaries as having claimed that he, quote, "...drove a trade equal to that of the East India Company, for I have known him in a year to fit out above twenty sail of ships between three hundred and eight hundred tons." Now that's a bold claim, but remember here that the East India Company was big, but not the behemoth it was about to become. In King of the Pirates, E.T. Fox makes another bold assertion about Abdul Jafar. He tells us that he personally knew Alexander Hamilton. That Alexander Hamilton, the American founding father, the, the guy from the musical. And it's not impossible. Hamilton was, after all, the first secretary of the treasury. He was the founder of the Bank of the United States, and... Jafar was really rich. He was so rich that his trade empire was a major player in world affairs all throughout the 18th century. And when you think about it, as an Indian, he would have had good reason to make loans to a newly born country that was offering to poke England in the eye. Plus, that would lighten the military power that England was willing to turn against India while they were dealing with these American rebels. But... I am having trouble verifying that claim. Now, E.T. Fox is usually excellent with the history, so I tend to believe him. But Alexander Hamilton was 21 years old in 1776. That's when he went to work as an aide-de-camp for General George Washington. For this to be the same Abdul Jafar, who had a world-spanning trade empire in 1685... He would have had to have been very old when he knew Alexander Hamilton, maybe over a hundred. Of course, not impossible, but I'm suspecting that there may have been a son and heir somewhere in there that kind of got lost in translation. But still, it does show us the economic power, the political power, of this trade empire within the Mughal Empire. The very fact that they had four or five ships sailing with the Mughal's fleet should tell us something, a, a testament to his influence. And Henry Every was about to capture one of those ships, the Fateh Muhammad. In English, literally, the Conqueror Muhammad. And I should note that Fateh Muhammad may not be the correct name for the ship, giving regional variations in dialects in the Mughal Empire, it may have been something more like Fata Muhammundi, but the traditional name given is the Fata Muhammad. And she was a good prize. See, Fata Muhammad was a merchant ship, not a pilgrim vessel. Instead of a host of people prepared to worship at Mecca, it was filled with men who were there to trade. The Fateh Muhammad was full of rich goods and all of the proceeds of their trade. The reason she sailed with the larger fleet was for protection. But here, so close to home, she apparently believed that she no longer required that protection. And she was wrong. 
The Fatih Muhammad and her retinue had broken off from the main convoy of the Mughal fleet. Probably they were sailing for a different destination than Surat. With this prize in his spyglass, Every ordered the fancy to detach the pearl and to sail on hard, to sail past the convoy, and then to lie in wait. Meanwhile, Portsmouth Adventure and the Pearl would continue the pursuit. They would chase the convoy down right into Every's claws. All that night, the three pirate ships worked hard to get into position. At dawn, on the 8th of September, 1695, the sea just off the Indian coast was quiet. It was coated in a thick mist. The kind of mist that muted any but the loudest sounds, even those aboard your own ship. The kind of mist that made it impossible to see much past your own deck. Joseph Farrow and William Mason, with the last known position of Fateh Muhammad in their minds, moved cautiously through the fog. It's always sudden when a ship appears out of a dense mist, and this was no different. The small convoy of Muslim ships seemed to appear suddenly, shockingly, and they were very close to the pirates. But if the pirates were surprised, Fateh Mohammed was more so, and frightened. Two ships clearly Europeans, appeared out of nowhere, less than a hundred paces away. I can, I can hardly imagine what that's like. And the Portsmouth Adventure fired off a single shot, a single thunderous explosion that broke the early morning quiet. A couple of heartbeats later, the ball fell into the water mere feet away from the Fateh Muhammad. Like a signal, the pirates aboard Portsmouth Adventure and the Pearl began to scream and curse at their prey. They brandished their sabers and their muskets and their pistols. They made a terrifying sight. It was the kind of thing from which any sane man would run. And the captain of the Fata Muhammad was a sane man. And run he did. Despite the dense fog, Fateh Muhammad ran away from the two pirate ships right into the jaws of a third. That shot from the Portsmouth Adventure probably never was intended to hit Fateh Muhammad. Rather, it was intended to frighten the Muslim ship and to give a signal to Henry Every. And he had certainly heard it. Every put his crew into motion. They loaded the guns. They raised anchor. And then... They waited, they listened, and stared into the dense fog. And then, of a sudden, there she was. The triangular sails of the Fateh Muhammad burst into view very nearby. One of the lookouts aboard Fancy, that man Dunn that we quoted earlier, he would tell the court that she was, quote, within about a pistol shot of Fancy. Now, exactly what happened next is difficult to say. There are differing accounts and we don't have an account of the captain of Fateh Muhammad. We do know, though, that almost as soon as she emerged from the fog, as soon as she saw the fancy, Fateh Muhammad fired off a broadside. And somehow, and exactly what that how is, somehow, she missed. If I were to try and distill those different versions of events, and try to make an educated guess, I might paint a picture something like this. Fateh Muhammad carried six guns on her. They had swivel guns as well, but six big guns. When she ran from Portsmouth Adventure and the Pearl, the captain may have ordered the guns on one side of his ship readied for action, had them loaded and primed, had them ready to fire. His plan may have been to run, but then when the time was right, when his convoy was ready, to turn and open fire with all of his ships on the incoming pirates. They would have had to hit something, and at that point they would have been in a better situation to fight. But as they were running, out of the fog appeared a behemoth. Fateh Muhammad was a big ship as far as the Dows went, but Fancy was larger. She was imposing, she was terrifying. I suspect that when she appeared out of the fog, that the crew of Fateh Muhammad, or maybe the captain, 
panicked and fired off a broadside. Guns that had already been readied, but that were prepared to fight a ship coming from the other direction. That broadside flew out into empty water. It did, though, surprise the hell out of the fancy. That a ship like this would fire back at all was a surprise, but that she did so almost immediately, like, boom, here's this ship, and now they're shooting. There was a worry that they may have been dealing with a very crack crew. Now, there are differing events of what follows here as well, but I'm going to deal with the one I like more. Portsmouth Adventure and the Fancy drew up on either side of Fateh Muhammad, and with their small arms they opened fire. Now, this was an odd era in piracy. It's kind of a blend of the later era of men like Blackbeard, pirates who had six or eight or ten pistols strapped across their chest. But it's also still got some of that buccaneer era where they had musket fire, It was probably the fire that the two pirate vessels rained down on Fateh Muhammad, probably a blend of both. Muskets for the sharpshooters and pistols for closer range work, with the odd swivel gun thrown in, not to mention the blunderbuss. While the pirates were firing as fast as they could reload, they threw grappling hooks across the water, and each ship pulled on the Fateh Muhammad, moving their own ship in close. Now, they had the high ground when they were aboard their pirate ships, but you can't take another vessel from your own deck. Once they were in close enough, the pirates grabbed ropes and swung over to the enemy ship into a brutal fight. The crew of Fateh Muhammad had plenty of guns of their own, and the first men who landed on deck fell to hot iron ripping through their flesh. But those guns did take a minute to reload, and more pirates were swinging across all the time. Soon enough, the guns were dropped, and it turned to a fight of swords. Relatively thin English and French naval cutlasses clashed with the thick, heavy-bladed Muslim scimitar. Soon every man was fighting, struggling for purchase on a blood-stained deck. Then, all of a sudden... As the last few sailors fell to pirate blades, the pirates realized that they held the deck. It seemed maybe like victory, but the fight wasn't over. The crew of the Fateh Muhammad had fallen back. They reloaded their guns, and they took cover in the holds below deck. They forced the pirates to venture below, and at every twist and turn inside the guts of the dhow, the pirates faced a hail of gunfire. Two hours of slow, methodical hunting followed in the darkness of the ship's interior. It must have been a terrifying experience, and a lot of pirates were wounded and died. But more of the Fateh Muhammad's men died. When those two hours were up, she was clear of men resisting the pirates. They were all dead or captured. It shocked the pirates a bit that the crew had fought as hard as they did. Now, there were a couple of good reasons for that. First, Abdul Jafar hated pirates. He'd had run-ins with them before, most notably in 1691. Now, that actually turns out to have been a Dutch crew, but he couldn't tell the difference. Abdul Jafar assumed that the pirates were English and that the English, all of them, were pirates. He'd lost the goods in that ship and held a bit of a grudge. He ordered the men who sailed under him to fight with everything they had should they be boarded by pirates, and they did. The other reason, though, that they fought so hard was the cargo. Fateh Muhammad was chock full of precious metal. Silver and gold, and nearly all of it coined, lay in chests that littered every hold and cabin on the ship. The pirates were stumbling over new hordes of wealth every time they turned around. At the time, the value of the hard specie alone, so not counting the cargo, just the coins, was estimated to be around 60,000 pounds. Translated into modern currency, that's about 5 million modern American dollars, or 4.2 million euro. Which... Sounds like a lot of money, and I mean it is, 
but not enough money. If they divided this haul between all 400 pirates, it would equal somewhere around $12,500 each modern money. Now, at the time, in a place like, say, America, that would have been enough to buy some land and a house and a horse and some tools and some seeds and basically everything you might need to start a farm and build a small family, which might have been enough for some of the men, but most of them were not here in the Arabian Sea so they could go be farmers. Once they'd counted all the loot, the crew sat down to a council, and they decided that this was good, but it could be better. They elected to sail on, hunting for more and, hopefully, richer prizes. Next time, The Gun's Way. The character of Muslim conquest throughout the centuries doesn't have one single flavor. Early Islam was harsh with the pagan tribesmen in Arabia, but when they started moving into other lands, they took pains to deal fairly with other religions of the book. In most cases, Christians and Jews were taxed at the same level as Muslims. They often had an almost complete freedom of worship. Now, of course, this state of affairs didn't last. You know, with the territorial conflicts in the Byzantine Empire and then in Iberia and, of course, the Crusades, there was a lot of bad blood there. However, considering the treatment of pagans in the Middle East, one might think that any other non-Abrahamic faith peoples would receive the same kind of treatment, but that wasn't always the case. In India, after the Mughal conquest, Hindus weren't persecuted. And you know, you probably need some caveats there, like they weren't unusually persecuted or harshly persecuted. They were a conquered people, after all. But their taxes were not any higher than the Muslims paid. They were free to worship however they chose. For much of the imperial period, things like property rights were respected. Because the empire in India was not about faith or spreading their religion, it was about what most empires are about, land and power and money. Now, in part, this was just a simple question of logistics for the Mughal Empire. You know, there's a lot of people in India. Mass conversion was going to be a difficult task, if it was even possible. I mean, physically rounding them up, that's just not going to happen. Even if you manage to kill every Hindu in India, which may have been the greatest mass slaughter in history, but even if that happened, then what? The empire needed people to work the land, to farm spices and teas, and to do all of the things that made India a worthwhile conquest. So they left the Hindus religiously basically alone. So what you have in the Mughal Empire is a subcontinent of Hindu people ruled over by a relatively small aristocratic elite. But imagine that you've got, what, a billion people? Probably fewer in the late 17th century, but certainly hundreds of millions of people. And were they all converted to Islam, they would be expected to make that pilgrimage to Mecca at some point in their lives. That would be, well, the expense alone would be astronomical. You know, most Muslim states provided some kind of transport, and, of course, that required guards, and for a lot of those states, even some financial assistance to those who required it for their trip to Mecca. Offering those kind of services for the whole of India, well, that's just out of the question, even for the Grand Mughal Aurangzeb, the world conqueror, maybe the richest person in the world in the 1690s. Even for him, that would be a bit much to ask. So, you know, let the people worship their gods. Now, let me pose to you a question. Say you were involved in a heist, a big score, and you found out that the victims of that robbery would be a bunch of widows and orphans. 
Would you have second thoughts about going through with it? I certainly hope so. What if you found out it was a bunch of farmers and laborers, you know, blue-collar folks, regular working people? Would you still have second thoughts? Probably. But what if you found out that it was a casino magnate moving his cash or... The, the Queen's Jewels, or Scrooge McDuck in a swimming pool full of gold coins. If that was who you were robbing, would you feel the same kind of reservation, the same kind of guilt? You know, maybe. Robbery is still morally wrong, but then again, maybe not. Maybe you were fine with it. This is episode 220 the gun's way. We should remember that the sailors aboard Henry Avery's fancy man of war were, well, they were pirates and mutineers. They made a decision to be so. But at least those that set out with the Spanish expedition, they didn't intend to do so. They were just law-abiding sailors who took a job that they hoped would help them earn a decent living. But of course that prospect was ripped out from under them. The possibility of being sold into slavery under the king of Spain, well, that became very real. So they went rogue. Were that your reality? You know, not a hardened criminal, but somebody who found yourself in dire circumstances and forced into a state of outlawry, you might be more than happy to rob some rich, aristocratic types. That's a major factor in what's about to happen, but of course there's more to it than that. The rich people in question here happen to be Muslim, and in 17th century eyes, that makes robbing them, even killing them, almost a righteous act. You know, they're attacking the Turk, taking on the Moorish scourge, doing God's work. They're the new crusaders, right? And for the English on board, they believed that they were at the time at war with the Islamic world. Which is to say that for these pirates in the Indian Ocean, scruples and reservations aren't something that we need to think about. But of course, these discussions did take place. Some time later, in the trials of some of the men aboard Fancy, They made it clear that Every was declaiming these kind of talking points and councils aboard their ship, reminding the men of the injustice they had faced of the threat of slavery, and then reminding them that they were going to attack the enemy, their king's enemy, in a righteous and godly act. Anyone who may have been thinking this was a bad idea, Henry Every talked them out of it. When we last left the pirates, Henry Every's fancy, William Mason's pearl, and Joseph Farrow's Portsmouth adventure had just captured a rich prize, the Fata Muhammad. You'll recall that, back at the Gate of Tears, the entrance to the Red Sea, after hearing word that the Mughal fleet had passed them by in the night, they set out at top speed to chase the fleet down. So fast, in fact, that they left Thomas II in the Amity and Thomas Wake in the Susanna behind. The chase lasted for ten days, and for ten days the pirates saw nothing. It was only when they drew near to a bay that would lead them to Surat, should they follow it, that they caught up with Fata Muhammad. But what the pirates here did not know was that at some point in their ten-day chase, they had actually passed the Mughal fleet. They all thought that Fata Muhammad was a straggler, that they'd managed to catch one of the last ships in the fleet. But instead, they had caught up with a ship that was way out in front of the fleet. Remember, the Fata Muhammad was owned by a private merchant, a merchant so rich he rivaled the East India Company, but someone who was not in any way officially attached to the Grand Mughal or his family. His ships were sailing with the fleet for protection, but they were free to sail as they pleased and once they were safely beyond the Gate of Tears, it looks like they took a different route than the rest of the fleet, something that would get them home more quickly. The other ships, those that actually did belong to the Grand Mughal or his family, well, they sailed way out to sea. From the Gate of Tears, they took a wide berth out into the Indian Ocean in a, in a large arc, 
to bring them to that approach to Surat. They did so, naturally, to avoid pirates. But by this point, so close to Mughal shores, they would certainly be safe. I mean, no pirates would be foolhardy enough or stupid enough to sail into those dangerous waters. But the other ships in the fleet, the Amity and the Susanna, the ships that were too slow to keep up with the fancy, well, they figured it out. They were sailing as hard as they could, trying to catch up with the fancy, but unable to do so. But while they were in pursuit, they encountered some ships that they did not expect to meet. We know virtually nothing about the encounter that followed. It's doubtful that Thomas II set a course to intercept these ships that he found. Amity and Susanna were brigantines, they were small, and these were Mughal ships. They were Ganjadao, the largest that the fleet had to offer. They were massive, ship-of-the-line-sized craft. Any one of them would have towered over Thomas II's tiny little ship. They did carry fewer guns than a first- or second-rate ship-of-the-line, but that hardly mattered here. When they fired a broadside, it was still a wall of cannonballs. Unless Thomas too was immensely foolish, and I don't think he was, he would have tried his best to avoid even one ship like that, and here were several. And it looks like he almost succeeded. Now, we don't know what ship it was that he met with. Some older histories will name the Fata Muhammad, but that's incorrect. It would have been impossible. Henry Every was way out front, and this was the same day that he captured Fata Muhammad. It looks like some historical wires got crossed there. Others have suggested that it was the Ganji Sawai. That's a ship that we are about to become quite familiar with, but that also seems unlikely, for reasons we will discuss shortly, but not impossible. I think it more likely that Thomas II and Thomas Wake happened upon the rest of the fleet. We don't know how many, but it's possible as many as 18 ships, some of them very large Ganja Dao. Probably after Henry Every captured Fatu Muhammad, but that same morning. If so, it's likely that he encountered the same kind of dense mist through which Henry Every fought. It's possible that Thomas II and Thomas Wake didn't even know the Mughal fleet was there until it was too late. I picture a fleet of large, latine-rigged vessels coming up from the south in a relatively straight line, all of them beautifully painted and carved and ornamented. They spot a pair of small, square-rigged European ships and draw up a line, maybe more of a concave semicircle. And I wonder if the spyglass played any kind of role here. The Muslim world had been way ahead of the curve in lens-based looking-glass technology, but as far as I can tell, they did not yet have a telescopic spyglass. At least, they weren't manufacturing them. This fleet, even if they had to buy them, certainly would have been in possession of the spyglass. Thomas II and Thomas Wake probably were not. If that's the case, I wonder if the pirates even knew they were out there. But of course, it's all speculation. We don't know what happened here. We do know that the Muslim fleet opened fire on the two pirate ships. I picture that same dense mist, quiet on deck, and then the thunder of a few hundred big guns, accompanied by a brilliant red glow through the mist, and then that wall of cannonballs raining down on the two small pirate vessels. One of those cannonballs hit Captain Thomas II in the stomach. It ripped through him, probably dragging him back as it tore through his torso, before finally breaking free and leaving Thomas II on the deck, dying but not dead. Well, not yet. Reportedly it took some time, not long, but minutes, for him to breathe his last. Thomas II in the Indian Ocean, died in battle on the 5th of September, 1695. He was not alone, of course. That volley of shot had torn through those two pirate ships, killing many and wounding many, many more. 
and at present they were reloading. The two brigantines were damaged, Amity badly, so it looks like she lost her mainmast, but the men who were still breathing and able to move got their ships underway and ran as hard as they possibly could. Now it must have been a difficult maneuver, they were still under fire, but they both pulled it off. Amity and Susanna, with what crew remained, would make it back to Madagascar. And we will catch up with them soon enough, but not today. Today, some leagues to the east, Captains Henry Every, Joseph Farrow, and William Mason had dropped anchor just off the coast. They were all gathered on board the fancy to count their loot, and they had a decent haul from Fata Muhammad. A good score, but not, not great. They had a council there in which they all decided to continue the hunt. They all agreed that most of the Mughal fleet was probably on its way to Surat by now, but they might happen upon another straggler, and if not, there were still plenty of big fish out there. But as morning gave way to afternoon, as that mist dissipated, the biggest fish in the world appeared on the horizon. The pirates did not yet know it, but the ship that appeared was almost certainly at that moment carrying more wealth in her holds than any other vessel in the entire world. Now we're going to talk more about the ship itself, the Ganji Sawai, of who was on board and what it carried next time. For now I want to talk about the Gunsway. It's the same ship, but the English called her Gunsway, the distinction being, in my mind, and how I'm choosing to describe it, that the Gunsway is the ship before the pirates knew what they had in hand. Of course, as yet, she was not in hand. All they knew at the moment was that she was... She was big. A mammoth, leviathan of a ship. A titan that rivaled the greatest vessels in the Royal Navy, or the Armada de Barlavento, or the Spanish treasure fleet. Fancy was a nice ship. A frigate of 46 guns and 200 men. Portsmouth Adventure was no slouch either, nearing those statistics... And the Pearl was doing her best, but this ship was a giant. Any wise man who came into her presence would weigh anchor, turn around, and leave immediately. But of course, pirates are not known for their wisdom. On board the Fancy, the pirates gathered together and held a quick conference. They decided to attack. And they did come up with a plan, at which point all of the pirates returned to their respective ships, weighed anchor, and set sail. What is to come is among the most famous pirate attacks of all time. There is still debate about the most profitable pirate attack of all time, but this is always in the discussion, sometimes at number one. Beyond that, there are political ramifications, wartime ramifications. This action, on which Henry Every and his companions are about to embark, is going to change the world. It was debated, discussed, argued about, and written about at length, in its time and in the years to follow. And we know what happened here, in the Indian Ocean, on the afternoon of September 5th, 1695. But we're not going to talk about what happened today. Because we, well, historians, have really only pieced together what happened in relatively recent years, the 20th century. For almost 300 years, the story as we know it, based on a true story, sure, but not quite right. So today, before we talk about what really happened, we're going to talk about the story as it was known to people for so many years. I'm going to read three versions of this history as they were told, in chronological order. The first account which we will look at comes from the life and adventures of Captain John Avery, the famous English pirate raised from a cabin boy to a king, now in possession of Madagascar, by Adrian von Broek. This account was first published in London in 1709. Von Broek writes, quote, Being victualled afresh, he, Every, incited some persons who had been buccaneers to join him, and with all imaginable expedition set sail to cruise in the Indian Sea, where, 
after an oath taken of every individual mariner. For secrecy in the affair they were going in pursuit of, he tacked about backwards and forwards for a considerable time before any prize of value came in sight. At last, Fortune threw in his way a vessel of great burthen. That is, burden, he means a big ship. For she carried near a thousand men, with guns proportionable, was freighted with the richest merchandises of all the East, and had got a prize of greater value about her. I mean the granddaughter of Aurangzeb, who was then great mobile, and commanded an empire almost as extensive as any known quarter of the world. The force of the ship and the vast number of soldiers that appeared on its deck at first gave no small uneasiness to Captain Avery, who was loath to miscarry in his first attempt, and seemed doubtful of success. But, having collected himself, he considered his own strength, the bravery of his own men, and their wonderful skill in naval raconteurs, while the numbers of the others would rather be a hindrance to him. And that's how he wrote it, to him, to apostrophe E-M, would rather be a hindrance to him than an advantage. The English gave but a broadside or two when the Indians struck their colors and resigned themselves to the mercy of their enemies. The cargo of this ship was so very rich, you know what, we're going to leave it there. As I said, we'll talk about the cargo next time. This account isn't terrible. It's closer to the truth, at least, than the other two we are going to talk about. In response to this book, which is a fiction outside of the attack on the Mughal fleet, Daniel Defoe wrote The King of Pirates. It was written in a first-hand account, and it's close to my own heart. He begins it with the assumption that Henry Avery sailed on the first and second Pacific adventures. When they come to the day of the attack, Daniel Defoe writes, quote, We spied three ships coming right up to us with the wind. We could easily see they were not Europeans by their sails. And take note of that and begun to prepare ourselves for a prize, not for a fight, but were a little disappointed when we found the first ship full of guns and full of soldiers, and in condition, had she been managed by English sailors, to have fought two such ships as ours were. However, we resolved to attack her if she had been full of devils, as she was full of men. Accordingly, when we came near them, we fired a gun with shot, as a challenge. And he's saying there that they fired a gun without a ball, loaded with shot but no ammunition. He continues, They fired again immediately, three or four guns, but fired them so confusedly that we could easily see they did not understand their business. When we considered how to lay them on board, and so to come athwart them, if we could, but falling, for want of wind, open to them, we gave them a fair broadside. We could easily see by the confusion that was on board that they were frightened out of their wits. They fired here a gun and there a gun, and some on that side that was from us, as well as those that were next to us. The next thing we did was to lay them on board, which we did presently, and then gave them a volley of our small shot, which, as they stood so thick, killed a great many of them, and made all the rest run down under their hatches, crying like creatures bewitched. In a word, we presently took the ship, and having secured her men, we chased the other two. One was chiefly filled with women, and the other with lumber. Upon the whole, as the granddaughter of the great mogul was our prize in the first ship, so the second was her women, or, in a word, her household, her eunuchs, all the necessaries of her wardrobe, her stables, and of her kitchen. End quote. I love Daniel Defoe. Attack her if she were full of devils, as she was of men. Just, just a great writer. But there are a few things I want you to take into account there. First, as I mentioned, the pirates noticed that she was an Indian ship because of her Latin sails. Then, there's no mention there of Captain Every's cowardice. But there is great mention of the cowardice of the Mughal soldiers. His tactics aren't really that close to the truth. There were, after all, three ships there on the day, in reality, and he only makes mention of the one. Finally, again, the granddaughter of the Mughal is mentioned, and this time, her entire household. Our first passage, by Adrian von Broek, goes into great detail about 
Henry Everie's return to Madagascar, where he raised himself up as a king, with that Grand Mughal's granddaughter as his queen. Daniel Defoe spends less time on that story. Around the same time that The King of Pirates was published, though, a play was released, written by a man named Charles Johnson. Now, this is not to be confused with Captain Charles Johnson, author of A General History. This was a playwright. Although it's not unthinkable that whoever actually wrote A General History of the Pirates used that as an inspiration for his fictitious captain, Charles Johnson. That play, the successful pirate, although Henry Every is never named, is clearly based on Henry Every. He's played for laughs in the play, he's a fool, but he does kidnap and then marry the Grand Mughal's granddaughter, who naturally runs circles around him, plays him for a fool every chance she gets. But that play, in addition to the name of the author, appears to have influenced Captain Charles Johnson, whoever he or she may really have been, in a general history of the robberies and murders of the most notorious pirates. This account, from 1724, was, for almost 300 years, the most accepted version of events. I've got, as you might imagine, a lot of books on pirates. And many of the older books, from the middle 20th century and before, all have chapters on Henry Avery that ape, or that's not strong, they plagiarize. They plagiarize Captain Charles Johnson completely, word for word in many cases. Captain Charles Johnson wrote in The Life of Captain Avery in A General History of the Pirates, quote, Having consulted what was to be done, they resolved to sail out on a cruise. Near the river Indus, the man at the masthead spied a sail, upon which they gave a chase, and as they came nearer they perceived her to be a tall ship, and fancied she might be a Dutch East Indiaman, homeward bound. But she proved a better prize. When they fired at her to bring two she hoisted mogul's colors, and seemed to stand upon her defense, Avery only cannonaded at a distance, and some of his men began to suspect that he was not the hero they took him for. However, the sloops made use of their time, and, coming one on the bow and the other on the quarter of the ship, clapped her on board and entered her, upon which she immediately struck her colors and yielded. She was one of the great mogul's ships, and there were in her several of the greatest persons of his court, among whom it was said was one of his daughters, who were going to a pilgrimage in Mecca. End quote. And then he goes on to talk about the riches as well. It's all very stereotypical riches of the Orient stuff. The first thing I take serious issue with, as you may have noticed by this point, is the assertion that the pirates thought she might be an East Indiaman. That ship was a ganja dao. It had, as we have mentioned several times, Latin rigged sails, big triangular sails, hard to miss. Daniel Defoe, of course, got that right, because Daniel Defoe knew a thing or two about sailing. And that makes me think that maybe Captain Charles Johnson did not. And here, in the strongest terms yet, Captain Johnson refers to Henry Avery's cowardice. The truth of that, well, that's a complicated story. A story that we're going to need to look at the real history to uncover. But to look at the real history, all three of these so-called histories are missing one very big thing, a singular vital element. They're missing the story from the other side. The story from the deck of the Ganji Sawai. All three versions tell a tale in which the pirates come up, fire a couple of shots, and then the ship just surrenders. That's not what happened. It's good propaganda, obviously, and next time we will discuss how that particular falsehood became accepted fact. But we're going to do so through the lens of, as far as we can tell here in the early 21st century, accurate factual history. Because they all get one thing right. On September the 5th, 1695, Henry Every and his companions did capture the greatest prize in the entire world. 
Last time, we talked about Captain Henry Every and the pirate ship Fancy, and their daring attack on a much larger and amazingly wealthy Mughal ship, the Gunsway. Really, though, we talked about some of the less-than-accurate accounts passed down through the years. Today, we're going to look at what really happened. From the mouths of those who were there, and those who investigated the scene, including the accounts and histories from the Mughal world. This is episode 221, Ganji Suwai. We don't actually know who owned Ganji Suwai. I've been saying it was the Mughal's ship, owned by Aurangzeb himself, and for a long time that was believed to be the case, but recent scholarship has spread doubt that that was actually true. See, while Aurangzeb was the richest man in the world, allegedly, and lived in extreme luxury, his personal wealth was also kind of state wealth. The emperor's treasury, the royal treasury, was the national treasury. This was pretty common in the old world. You know, when it came to light that King Louis XVI of France was broke, the French had a little revolution. He'd mismanaged the finances of the kingdom. So when the king invested in, say, a joint stock company, like King William III did in the East India Company or in the Spanish Expedition, well, that was understood to be a state investment. But if another member of his household, usually one of the women, say his mother or his sister, it could be his wife as well, but that was more complicated if she was the queen. But if one of the women of the household invested, that was family money. This was common in Western Europe at the end of the 17th century, but you see basically the same thing in the Mughal Empire. Now, Aurangzeb himself was harsh with the men in his family. He imprisoned his own father. He killed and or betrayed his brothers. His eldest son, who did lead a revolt against his father, but he died in prison. Of his two illegitimate sons, one died in exile and the other as the king of a foreign land. Kind of a luxurious exile. Only one of his four sons lived a full and long life and he was the son who succeeded, Aurangzeb. But the women of the court fared much better. You know, they lived lives of wealth and influence and real power of a sort. They could not actually supplant Aurangzeb, so therefore they enjoyed a lot more trust than the men in the family. One of the centerpieces of the wealth of these women of the court were the ships that they owned. Really, they were trading fleets that made themselves and the royal household quite a lot of money. Now, of course, Aurangzeb owned plenty of ships himself. But as they were also essentially state-owned affairs, they tended to be a lot more conservative and militarily powerful than those that were owned by his wives and daughters. They were kind of a merchant navy. Most historians today seem to agree that Ganji Sawai was owned by one of the women of the court. But we don't know who it was. I've seen almost everyone suggested. His mother and his wives, of course, but by 1696 they were all dead. By that time, there were really only three candidates. First, there was a Georgian-born slave girl named Udaipuri Mahal. Udaipuri was captured as a teenager and then sold two or three times to finally make her way to India, but she belonged to one of Aurangzeb's rivals. When that rival was defeated in battle and killed, Aurangzeb noticed this reportedly very beautiful and very young woman, and made her a concubine. She was probably about 15 or 16. By that point, Aurangzeb was 50. But he let her get away with just about everything. She was a deeply corrupt individual. She enriched herself to no end. Most scandalously, she liked to get really, really drunk, which, you know, in a Muslim society is pretty frowned upon. But even stuff like court intrigues and assassinations... Under normal circumstances, for most of his concubines and even his wives, they would have been reprimanded or exiled or even killed, maybe. But Udaipuri was young and vibrant, and reportedly for her entire life this 
exotically sexy beauty. The emperor, it's clear, was just wrapped around her finger. He overlooked everything she did. And she did own a fleet of ships. However, I think she's the least likely candidate here. The second candidate is one of Aurangzeb's daughters, Zinat Unnisa, who was actually older than his very young concubine. Must have loved that, but Zinat was a pious and devout Muslim. She was devoted to her father her entire life. She never married, and in the 1690s, just a couple of years before what we're talking about today, she was made mistress of the household. Now, when you're talking about the emperor's household, and the emperor is a man in his 80s, that's a position with a lot of power. And Zenot was a power broker. She and Udaipuri were locked in a kind of perpetual conflict. She is somewhat more likely as an owner of Ganji Sawai, but third, her name was Gauhar Ara Begum, and she was the emperor's little sister, the youngest of his siblings. Gauhar also never married. She spent her life in devotion to her father, the emperor, and then to her brother, the emperor. She ran the royal household for most of her life, that is, until her niece, Zenot, took over in the early 1690s. But that means that she decided things like marriage alliances and even policy decisions. You know, anyone who had any political influence on the emperor kind of had to be verified by her. And she never conspired against the throne. In fact, she was maybe its staunchest ally. She and Aurangzeb worked very closely. More than any of his wives ever could have hoped to be, she was the mistress of the household. Oftentimes, after he left his wives, late at night he would go to his sister's chambers to discuss policy with her. And when she died, in March 1707, Aurangzeb was heartbroken. He never recovered from that blow. He would die only three months later. I'm trying to say here that they were really close, close in a way that one might associate with a man and wife, only Aurangzeb was never anywhere near that close with any of his wives. Were something untoward to happen to his baby sister, Aurangzeb would have been furious. When we last left the pirates under Captain Henry Every, when we last left the facts behind, at least, they were all on the deck of Fancy, counting their loot from the Fata Muhammad. And that was when a very large ship appeared on the horizon. It's not impossible that this was the same ship that fired the cannonball that killed Thomas II on that very same day, September 5, 1695. The pirates all sat down to a quick council. Captain Joseph Farrow of the Portsmouth Adventure, of ninety tons, six guns, and sixty men, and Captain William Mason of the Pearl, two hundred tons, sixteen guns, and one hundred men. Well, they were all on board, including most of their crew. The former crew of the Dolphin, under Richard Want, which had been scrapped, was also on board, as were all of those French pirates. They decided to attack. Even when two smaller sets of sail appeared, they were going to attack her, and they came up with a plan. The crew of the Dolphin and all of those Frenchmen were going to get on board the Pearl and Portsmouth Adventure. Their job, the job of those two ships, was going to be to sail in to, you know, sure, if the opportunity presented itself, take a shot, but really to sail in close on either side of this big new prize and to board her. Meanwhile, Henry Every and Fancy were going to stay back. They were going to use Fancy's incredible speed to avoid fire from this newcomer. All the while, they would be bombarding this ship from afar. And they could do it. Fancy carried 46 excellent Dutch guns. With their plan in place, the pirates returned to their respective vessels and got underway. Now, you'll recall from last time that two of our older sources commented on Henry Every's cowardice in battle. This was commentary after the fact, at least it's 
not present in the record except for one possible mention as such in a trial transcript. Henry Every was a lot of things, and many of those things were bad, but he was a Navy man turned pirate, and he was not a coward. But it must have been hard to hold on to courage here. When those three Mughal ships got closer, not yet quite in range, but close enough, the sheer size of the largest was a shock. A ship like that was an intimidating sight, huge and bristling with guns. The number usually given is sixty big guns. Still, Fancy stood right in the road, that is, stood right in the path of Ganji Sawai, waiting to intercept her. This was a tactic intended to force the larger ship to pull up, stop, and prepare to fire, all the while Portsmouth Adventure and Pearl would get in close, but the tactic didn't work. Ganji Sawai fired off her two 18-pound chase cannons. Now these are smaller guns, mounted on the front of a ship facing forward. They're called chase cannons because if you're chasing down a ship, you'll be able to fire at them while staying under sail. Now, for those of you familiar with cannons, in, say, the American Civil War or the Napoleonic Wars even, those cannon might sound pretty big. You know, land-based cannons rarely got much bigger than about 20 pounds, and when you're talking about pounds, you're talking about the size of the cannonball, traditional round shot. Naval guns, though, got a lot bigger. Horses didn't have to trek them across hills and mountains on a ship. The standard round shot size for most of the age of sail was 36 pounds. And that could be extrapolated to other kinds of shot. You know, if you had a canister of grape shot, it would carry a lot more grape shot than in an 18-pounder. Now, the largest ships of the line, and you rarely saw these here in the 1690s, but later on, the largest would occasionally carry a complement of 64-pound guns. These weren't all their guns, these were their heavy shot. And they were rarely used in battle unless it was against another floating fortress, or, I suppose, a regular fortress. Which is to say, in this situation, 16-pound chase guns are pretty paltry especially when they're loaded with round shot, with cannonballs. Had they been using chain shot, that would have been a lot more useful. Timed properly, it would have torn through Fancy's rigging. It would cause real havoc on deck, what with snapping ropes and falling sail, but mostly chain shot would slow your prey down. Perfect for chase cannons, really what they're made for. Of the two 18-pound balls shot off by Ganji Sawai, one just flew right by harmlessly. But the other did strike a direct hit on Fancy's mizzenmast. And then it bounced off. No damage was done to speak of it. It did, though, show the pirates on board that this ship was prepared to fight. And that, I think that is what might really have terrified the pirates who were prepared to board her aboard the other two vessels. Once they got in close enough to get a good look at the guns and realized that she was ready to fight and then saw the sheer number of men on board. The Mughal ship had 200 crewmen, more than any ship in their fleet, but that's nothing. It had 200 dedicated soldiers on deck, all of them armed with exquisite muskets and vicious-looking sabers. Now, again, the sources are kind of split here. Whatever the cause may have been, Portsmouth Adventure and the Pearl held back. Now, this has been cause for some historians, some of them very good historians, to call them cowards. But I'm not so sure about that. I think that this may have been part of the plan, or maybe... Once they saw what they were dealing with, it became part of the plan. Now, the men on board Fancy might not have been aware that that was now the plan, but, I mean, you'd have to be crazy to go on board a ship like that before the Fancy softened her up. It would have been suicide. Which was, of course, the plan. To call them cowards here at the outset, I mean, Fancy hadn't fired a single shot yet. But Henry Every did put that plan into motion. 
Fancy set sail and moved out of Ganji Sawai's path. They took a wide arc around her. Now, this would have taken some time. It would keep Fancy out of range of the Mughal ship, while allowing Ganji Sawai to sail on past Fancy and the other pirates. A foolish captain might think that they were giving up, letting her get away, and it was a risky move on the part of Fancy. But she was very fast, so not that risky. After taking her wide arc around Ganji Sawai, Henry Every and Fancy began to creep up from behind. Now, they could have taken a couple of shots, but Fancy did not. However, this was not stealth, as it has occasionally been portrayed. I mean, it's not like the Mughal sailors didn't know that Fancy was there. They could just look over there and see her behind them, coming up on them quickly. But Fancy was, in a manner of speaking, in a blind spot. Fancy's approach kept her out of the line of any of the guns on board Ganji Sawai. You know, they had guns on the front, the chase cannon. They had a full complement of guns for a broadside, and they had guns on the rear. But the aft edges of the ship, the corner at the rear, that was a vulnerable spot. The only guns available would be swivel guns, if they had them, and muskets. Now, was this Henry Every's master stroke? It's often portrayed that way, but I think that's hindsight speaking. I think that this was just Henry Every doing what the fancy, the Charles II, was built to do. You know, a fast ship like that could catch up with a giant like Ganji Sawai with little trouble. Now picture these two ships from a bird's eye view. The larger of the two is moving forward at a steady pace, but the smaller is in pursuit and catching up. When she gets close, when she almost reaches that back corner of the ship, the pilot is going to turn the wheel and move Fancy away from Ganji Sawai. Now think about where the guns would be positioned. The broadside from Ganji Sawai would have a very difficult time hitting Fancy, but Fancy at about a 45-degree angle, would be excellently positioned for a full broadside. At which point, if they needed to swing around for another shot, they did have the opportunity, but of course, one assesses the situation. This is a safe strategy. It does take some time, of course, and it gives your prey an opportunity to escape. But when you're facing down such superior firepower... It's the safest way to attack. Certainly much, much safer than pulling up alongside one of these massive warships and trading volleys back and forth. That's a losing game. And Fancy did have to be careful here. Careful not to take a hit, obviously, but also careful not to strike too critical a blow on Ganji Sawai. They wanted her to stop, or at least slow down. Surrender would be amazing, but mostly they wanted her not to sink. That would mean their treasure ended up at the bottom of the sea. To that end, instead of using round shot, which could do real damage, they tended to prefer chain shot and grape shot. It would kill, it would maim, and it would disable a ship, but not sink them. But in these situations, aiming, really timing your shot, was difficult. Remember, Ganji Sawai was huge. If Fancy was going to fire on the main deck and the rigging with their chain shot and grape shot, they were going to have to wait until their ship, the Fancy, bobbed up in the water. Then, at the crest of a wave, they would be at the proper angle to fire and hopefully hit something. The sailors on board Fancy were very good at their jobs, and their first volley hit. Did a lot of damage on board. But still, that's only the beginning of a long day of such fighting. Or so they thought. As was expected, Ganji Sawai fired back. And of course she missed, that was the point of Henry Every's tactic here. But at this point, Fancy should have pulled away to get out of range, that was the plan, but she didn't. When the Mughal ship fired that return volley, the pirates heard something odd. It might have taken them some time to figure out what had happened, 
Later trial transcripts suggest they didn't even really know yet what it was, but when Captain Every pulled out his spyglass and inspected the deck of the enemy ship, it would have been clear. One of the big guns on board Ganji Sawai had exploded. Now this kind of thing happened a lot. On gun decks, they usually had barriers, protections in place in case it did, but this happened on the exposed main deck, where, we should remember, all of those 200 soldiers were milling around, waving their sabers and doing their best to look intimidating. Everyone who was in the blast radius was blown back, and anyone who was nearby in the first couple of lines was hit with blazing hot bronze shrapnel. You know, at least a couple of dozen men were injured in the blast, some of them seriously, some of them killed. And because of this accident, the crew lost focus, and Captain Henry Every took the opportunity. Rather than moving away as he had planned to do, Fancy pulled up right alongside Ganji Sawai, pretty close, in fact. His gunners got to work. They opened fire and struck a few more successful hits in rapid succession. Now, the Mughal crew was struggling to get back into the fight here, and finally, they did. But by this point, it wasn't going to do them much good. It's possible that the crew on board Ganji Sawai just weren't very good at their job, that they were inexperienced at gunnery. Now, that would be a surprise to me on a ship like this, but possible. Either way, they did fire back, but they did so irregularly. You know, we talked about needing to shoot at the right moment, and they never seemed to do it, and they never shot together. They never had a solid volley. That means that though they did get quite a few shots off, none of them really seemed to hit the fancy. Ganji Sawai, as we may have noted, was really, really big and all of her guns were up really, really high. Perfect for a battle of the line, right? You know, standing in defiance and firing at the enemy from a long distance, but not for a fight with a ship like Fancy. Nearly every shot that Ganji Sawai fired sailed harmlessly over the Fancy. They did a little damage to the rigging. The mainmast, which had been damaged earlier that morning in the fight with Fata Muhammad, well, it was damaged again, but again not totally broken. If Ganji Sawai had used chain shot here, it would have been over. Fancy would have been unable to do anything, dead in the water. But she didn't. They might not have had chain shot, but if they did, it would have saved the day. Instead, nearly all of their round shot, fired sporadically and at the worst possible times, splashed into the ocean on the far side of Fancy. Now, at this point, the pearl, on the other side of Ganji Sawai began to move in on her, and Portsmouth Adventure did not. And this has been attributed to cowardice, but I would be surprised if that were the case. You know, maybe Captain Pharaoh lost his nerve, but I think more likely he was probably busy. Most accounts of this day tend to focus on Fancy and Ganji Sawai, for good reason, but remember there were two other Mughal ships out there, and they were going to be captured. And oftentimes they're just tacked on after the fact. It's all, Captain Henry of Arena Notorious Arch Pirate captured the Mughal ship and did horrible things, and then also the other two ships, yeah, whatever. But I think that Captain Pharaoh, the second largest ship in their fleet, was probably busy dealing with them. While the Pearl sailed up to aid Fancy in capturing the really big prize. Now, boarding the ship was going to be no small task here. With 200 crewmen and 200 soldiers, the potential defense force that Ganji Sawai could put into action far outnumbered what Fancy and Pearl could put aboard. Even if they'd tossed in Portsmouth Adventure, they still had more men. Even considering the casualties they had already suffered that day, they still had more men. Added to that, boarding was a slow process, especially against a larger enemy. You know, if you were taking a ship that was smaller than you, you could fire down upon them with impunity. But in this situation, they couldn't fire up on them when they were right up alongside. 
You know, some of their crack shots could have gone all the way to the opposite edge of the fancy and with their muskets picked off anybody who came to the rail and that would do some good, but not a lot of good. The men who climbed on board Ganji Sawai were going to be doing so almost blind. Happily, flintlock pistols were by this point the preferred firearm of the pirates. So Fancy sent out their grappling hooks and pulled themselves in close to Ganji Sawai, as did the Pearl. Then, with ropes in place, they began to climb the hull. And when they reached the top, they would have expected a wall of defenders waiting to cut them down. The smart move was to peek your head over, fire a shot with one of your pistols, assess the situation, and then jump over the rail, jumping out of the way if need be. Even then, a good number of men boarding the craft were going to die, but when the crew of Fancy and that of Pearl jumped over the rail, instead of a staunch defense which they had expected, the deck of Ganji Sawai was in chaos, utter bedlam, on board. Now, it's not clear that any of the pirates on board really understood what was going on. It was a confusing mass of humanity, but thanks to the sources from the Ganji Sawai, we know what was happening. The deck, indeed the ship, was in chaos because there were so many passengers on board, and many of them had crowded on deck. As a pilgrim ship, Ganji Sawai carried 600 passengers, men, women and children, families in most cases, none of whom had any business holding a sword or doing any fighting at all. They would have just gotten in the way. But when a trio of tiny, insignificant little pirate ships appeared on the horizon, the captain let them know about it. You know, maybe you should. Hey, everybody, there's pirates out there, not to worry. But all of these passengers crowded the deck to watch. They wanted to see these pirate ships get blown into oblivion, which of course they would because of the overwhelming force of their own vessel. And I mean, in that situation, wouldn't you do the same thing? I mean, when else are you going to see an exciting sea battle this close up? And it should have been safe. You know, the captain, had he been responsible, would have sent everybody back to their cabins, nothing to see here, but he didn't. But it really shouldn't have mattered. The overwhelming firepower should have taken care of these pirate ships. But of course, one of their guns exploded, and the battle began to turn south, and suddenly there was a host of deadly English barbarians crowding onto the deck. The passengers were terrified, and they began to scrabble away, trying to get below decks back to their cabins. Meanwhile, the soldiers were all trying to get into their own position to defend from the pirates who were scrabbling on deck. The end result was confusion. Nobody was where they should have been when the pirates appeared. There was no defense set up to meet them. Now, even in that situation, there should have been. But the commander here, the captain of Ganji Sawai, was an embarrassment. E.T. Fox writes in The King of Pirates, quote, It is in times of panic and distress such as this that the bold actions of a steadfast and resolute officer can inspire scared men and turn the tide of battle. Despite damage to the ship and losses to the crew, strong leadership could still save the day. Ibrahim Khan, captain of the Ganji Sawai, had no such qualities. End quote. And I want to place the blame for the events of the day squarely on Captain Ibrahim Khan's shoulders. Of course, you know, the pirates could have not done it, but if the captain had done his job, the pirates would almost certainly have failed. And with a name like Khan, and from the Mughal Empire, he probably was a descendant of the Khans, you would have hoped that he'd be a fierce fighter, but he wasn't. He was the captain of the flagship for the yearly pilgrim fleet to the Hajj, on a ship that was owned by one of the Grand Mughal's own family. It was a position that was prestigious and political. The Mughal Empire had no shortage of stout and resolute sea officers, but instead they chose a courtier someone who had earned a little bit of recognition and was given this uh, 
what was assumed to be easy job. When the pirates boarded, Ibrahim Khan ran away. He fled below decks and immediately hid out below, and that's bad enough, but he should have left someone in command. But he didn't. The crew was leaderless. They were lost. Then, well, it gets worse. Back in Mocha, a port on the Red Sea, Ibrahim Khan had acquired four slaves. They were European slaves, and no one is quite sure where they're from, but they probably didn't speak any Persian, which is the language that Mughal leadership spoke. Most likely, these four slaves were captured in Barbary pirate attacks on the Mediterranean. That would mean they were most likely Italian or French or Spanish. Their stories were likely similar to those of the Mughal's young concubine. These four slaves were all young women, or more accurately, really girls. And I can't imagine what the past several months of their lives had been like, what they'd been through. You know, to endure an attack by sea and then to be kidnapped and taken to Algiers or maybe Tunis, but then on to Alexandria, across Egypt, and finally down the Red Sea to Mocha. They were almost certainly alone, separated from their parents and the rest of their family if any of them survived. Most probably none of them knew each other until their sail in Arabia. Despite what was almost certainly an unimaginable amount of abuse, the one glimmer of brightness I can fathom for them is that they were most likely not raped. Though they were the property of Ibrahim Khan, they were probably an investment for him, bought in Mocha to be sold back in Surat to the highest bidder, and virgin girls fetched a much higher price at the slave markets there. But then an attack, and their owner rushes into the cabin, and, look, this is almost too unbelievable, but everybody seems to agree on this point. Ibrahim Khan released these four girls from their chains and pushed them into the hallway. Then he handed them armed and loaded guns and blades and told them to go fight. And to their credit, they started to climb on deck. But can you imagine that walk? I mean, the air must have been heavy with the stench of blood and gunpowder. There was a clash from above decks of steel on steel, and of course the sound of screaming. And these were, you know, they were still kids. But part of me here wonders if they didn't hold out hope that maybe, whoever these attackers were, they were going to rescue them. But when they emerged on deck, the scene that they walked into was a scene out of nightmares. The girls would have emerged near the aft, just at the edge of the quarter deck. And that little piece of the ship was probably still held by defenders, who had by this point rallied a bit. But the foredeck, the front of the ship, was filled with pirates, and the main deck in the center of the ship, the lowest of the exposed decks, well, that was, that was blood and carnage. Men were fighting cutlass to saber. They beat other men to death with the butts of their muskets everywhere were... Men and women and children, remember, who were dead or dying from shots taken in that first wave. Bits of human bodies, hands and arms and legs, were strewn about the deck, some of them maybe near their owner who was still screaming in agony. All around them was a stew of intestines and bone and brain and limp bodies, and all of that made movement on deck almost impossible. For anyone, it would have been a horrific sight. I can't imagine it for someone so young. Now, most naval battles were terrible, especially when it turned to fighting on deck, but this one was worse. Some of those older histories we talked about last time will tell you that the cowardly, weak Moors fled the battle immediately, but that's not what happened at all. It's true of their commander, sure, but the soldiers, they rallied and they put up a fight. And it was hard fighting from moment one. Now, when it was clear that the battle was lost, some did flee below decks, maybe to put up a resistance there. But soon enough, the crew of Ganji Sawai struck their colors and surrendered. That's the thing when relying on English sources, especially those who have little relationship with the truth. It's always propaganda about the weak and cowardly Moors, and when, of course, you look at the other side, the Englishmen were 
treacherous barbarians. Which, you know, they were pirates, but both sides fought here, and they fought hard. Somewhere near a third of the pirates from Fancy and Pearl were killed in this battle. They had almost 300 men in their numbers when they attacked, and by day's end it was down to 180. But the Mughal ship, with 400 combined crewmen and soldiers, they lost more. The pirates, under Captain Henry Every, had won the day. But of course, that's not a glorious story. This isn't the Alamo here. We always need to remember that pirates, even when they're romanticized, even when the reality is something that we might enjoy... At the end of the day, they're bad guys. And this was very bad news for all of those passengers on board. I don't know what happened to those four young slave girls. I like to think, to imagine that, amid all of that blood and death, the pirates spotted four young girls with faces that were whiter than those of the opponents they'd just been fighting. And when they noticed them, they stopped. Those girls probably spoke a little bit of French, or Spanish, or Dutch. Somehow they would have been able to communicate with these English, French, and Dutch pirates. I like to imagine that the pirates of the fancy bundled them aboard their own ship. To safety, that is. And I don't know what life would have looked like for them. You know, we know that they didn't miraculously get returned to London, or Marseille, or Cadiz. But maybe they sailed back to Libertalia with the fancy. There were, when later sailors would appear at either St. Augustine Bay or St. Mary's Island, there were occasionally notes of, hey, there's some white women here. So who knows, maybe they grew up and married one of the pirates that lived there. It would have been a hard life, but from a certain point of view, you know, it's kind of better than being married off to some old man to secure one of your father's business contracts. And I like to imagine that. You know, imagine these girls growing up and wearing trousers and smoking cigars and drinking rum. It makes a good story. Maybe a good young adult novel. With a group of educated young girls enslaved and then rescued by pirates to finally run the show back at Pirate Island. There's, you you know, a happy ending there. And I think it's good to imagine a happy ending here because... What's about to come isn't happy at all. Today's episode is going to be difficult. It contains some subject matter that's difficult for me to talk about and difficult to listen to. We're going to be dealing with some hard topics. There's torture and there's murder, But mostly there's rape. It's important to the history and the rest of this story. I'm not focusing on it for fun. There were historians and journalists who did exactly that. Chroniclers at the time and the years immediately following, and we will talk about them. But if this is a topic that you'd rather not spend your time listening to, you may just want to skip this one. There won't be anything that you won't be able to pick up on contextually later on, and we'll do a quick recap next time. Kevin Stroud is doing great work over on the History of English podcast, and Revolutions is neck deep in the Russian Revolution. You can always catch up with me next week. With that warning given, I'm going to jump right in. This is episode 222, Barbarity. September 5th, 1695 was a long day for the pirates under Henry Every. It's longer still for us. I don't think we've ever spent this long talking about a single day in pirate history. But of course, September 5th, 1695 is among the most important days in pirate history. In the morning, Henry Every captured Fata Muhammad aboard his ship Fancy, alongside William Mason's Pearl and Joseph Farrow's Portsmouth Adventure. At, or around, that same time, Thomas, too, was getting killed, some leagues to the east, in a sea battle. His ship Amity and Thomas Wake's Susanna fled the scene. 
and then a couple of hours later, Every, Pharaoh, and Mason encountered a trio of Mughal ships and engaged them in battle. The largest of the Mughal ships, Ganji Sawai, a.k.a. Gunsway, damaged Fancy's mainmast, but that's really all they managed to do. She wasn't equipped to fight a fast, well-armed, and expertly manned frigate like the Fancy. Moreover, her gunners just weren't up to the task. So the pirates of the Fancy and the Pearl boarded her. There were two hundred soldiers aboard Ganji Sawai who should have had no trouble dispersing this pirate rabble, but they weren't in position. In part, that's because so many of the 600 passengers on board were crowding the deck. More than that, though, it was a lack of proper leadership on the part of Captain Ibrahim Khan. He completely failed to do his duty. When the pirates boarded, he fled below deck. And at this point, the fight was already lost, really, but nowhere near over. Over 120 pirates would die in the fighting for Ganji Sawai. Even more Mughal crewmen and soldiers would die, and quite a few civilians who were stuck on deck when the pirates boarded. Last time I gave a pretty graphic description of the horror that was the result of that fight. But think about it. Well over 200 human beings were wounded or killed there on the deck of a ship. Even on a big ship like the Gunsway, it would have been crowded with gore. The other two Mughal ships, both of them smaller, Dao, really part of Ganji Sawai's retinue, were captured on that same day. I mentioned last time that I think Joseph Farrow was probably responsible for their capture. And that was almost certainly bloodless. If they carried any guns at all, they wouldn't have carried many. Portsmouth Adventure was probably just able to sail up, aim her guns, and accept surrender. They were supposed to be protected by Ganji Sawai, but obviously that wasn't going to happen. By early evening, all six ships would have been tethered together, and, you know, honestly, Fata Muhammad was probably still there as well, all of them bobbing in the open water as the sun began to sink. But I don't want you to picture here a peaceful scene. Sometimes, often, even, the aftermath of a pirate attack was peaceful. You know, tense, absolutely, but not a scene of violence or debauchery. Now, this usually happened when the pirates shared a nationality or a race with their victims, and when the victims surrendered. And none of that was the case here. Nearly everybody on board Ganji Sawai who wasn't a pirate was a Mughal Indian. There were, though, a few slaves, a few of them white, most of them not. John Sparks, one of the pirates present on Ganji Sawai that day, would be recorded later on in The Last Dying Words and Confession of John Sparks of the Fancy. He was said to feel deep remorse. One passage reads, quote, This villain expressed his contrition for the horrid barbarities he committed, though only on the body of heathens. The inhuman treatment and merciless tortures inflicted on the poor Indians and their women still afflicted his soul. End quote. It's that line, only on the body of heathens. It minimizes what happened, but this, what did happen, was so bad that it was still considered inhuman and merciless. A large part of the reason that Everything that is about to take place did take place is just racism. You know, the victims were brown-skinned Muslims and therefore not deserving of the same level of compassion, in the eyes of the victimizers, that is. But of course, that feeling was mutual. White Christians were treated barbarously by Islamic pirates all the time. It was a serious problem that plagued Europe for decades, centuries, really. There was this history of barbarity from both sides that goes all the way back to the Crusades, probably. Now, none of that, though, absolves these pirates of their guilt, and they are guilty. But the only reason we know so much about this particular act of barbarity is because of the diplomatic fallout that the powers that be in England feared. The Tense wartime environment was not a place to kill, torture, and sexually abuse a ship full of people. 
Now, we're never going to know exactly what happened on board. We don't know when it happened or how it happened. Probably, though, it all started on deck when the pirates began to interrogate the crew about the whereabouts of the treasure on board. First of all, they probably could communicate, at least a bit. The English certainly didn't speak any Persian, but there was very likely someone among the Indians on board that spoke some English. But when they were asked about the location of their treasures on board, the crew were apparently obstinate. They may have surrendered the battle, but they were not going to cooperate. That's when someone, and we don't know who, but Henry Every is a likely candidate, somebody ordered the pirates to begin killing prisoners. Probably not the person or the people that they could communicate with. More likely, it was someone else on the crew. You know, oh, you don't want to answer? Well, how about I kill a few of your friends? That, though, didn't seem to have much effect either. They still wouldn't talk. And that's when the torture began. Now, I, and a bunch of historians, have some beef with the government of England in 1696. Months after the attack on Gunsway, several of the crew of Fancy were put on trial. Now, we're not going to delve into that today. There's a whole episode about jury trials in England and your future, but that trial did not go as planned. Jury trials were the norm in England, and even though this trial was for all of the barbarous acts we are talking about today, the pirates were found not guilty. The jury turned out to be sympathetic, a bit anti-establishment, maybe. They'd been gobbling up all of those songs and poems about Henry Avery, and they weren't liable to convict them for crimes against the Turk. That's not how the court expected the trial to go. Really, it's not how it should have gone. The evidence was overwhelming, but the jury liked the pirates. And really... There was a good argument here. There wasn't any evidence that the pirates on trial were actually involved. One of them was old and sick. Another one was a young boy. It's not exactly who you picture in that situation, torturing, murdering, and raping. But the court disbanded, and then, and here's the real sin, they threw out the court records, just got rid of them. They don't exist anymore. What I wouldn't give to have a copy of those court records... There's a whole episode about government manipulation of public perception in the future as well, but that means that we don't know what the pirates had to say about their crimes on that day. We just don't have much detail here. Now, we have a great deal of detail about the mutiny on board Charles II some months earlier. Because when the court reconvened, that's how they nailed the pirates to the wall. But we do know that the pirates bound the prisoners and began to torture them. Blades slicing bits off, hot irons burning flesh, and pincers pinching. Probably there were bits of wood or maybe bits of bone shoved under fingernails. But still, the prisoners did not talk. Now, Henry Avery was probably overseeing all of this, the interrogation and then the torture. But there were other detachments of the crew, maybe from other ships, making their way through the lower decks. They did occasionally meet pockets of resistance and killed them, but mostly they were looking for treasure. And they were going to find it, they were going to find a lot of it. But first, they found the civilians. Naturally, the civilian cabins were above the holds, so that's what they ran into first. We don't know when or how the rapes began. I've seen it suggested that the first women raped on board Ganji Sawai were brought on deck as a, another means to get those men to talk. If torture wouldn't work, how about you watch us abuse your women? But we do know, or at least most historians agree, that this was not, as some contemporary chroniclers said, a calculated act. It was not organized mass rape. At first, there seemed to have been isolated incidents. You know, a pirate might venture below decks looking for treasure and stumble upon a woman. But in very short order, word began to get out. 
there were women down below. At first, a few pirates began to slip down there, then a flood. And when it became apparent that there were women hiding out on the other ships, one in particular, well, it got bad over there too. Now, in cases like this, you will often hear something like, well, the men hadn't seen a woman in so long, they just couldn't help themselves. And that's not an excuse even if they hadn't seen a woman in years, but it's not true here. These men had enjoyed the consensual attentions of a bunch of pretty young women over at Madagascar like a month ago, and they were headed back to Madagascar in just a couple of days. In a week or so, they could expect just as much again. They weren't that hard up. I think it's a better explanation that the pirates' blood was up after a fierce fight, and this was an extension of that. Now, that's not an excuse at all but it's an explanation. They were filled with adrenaline and rage and hate. This is an all-too-common symptom of battle. And it was something that was a well-known symptom of battle. The probability that they were going to be raped was not news to any of the women on board, at least not once the pirates arrived. And there's a part of me even now, that wants to explain this away. You know, it's a different time, that whole line, but the world of 1695 was not as different as we might think. About a hundred years later, in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte told his troops on the eve of their invasion of Egypt, discussing how to deal with the Muslim people, quote, The people here treat their wives differently from us. But in all countries, the man who commits rape is a monster. He was, of course, absolutely right here. He was also, of course, less concerned with right and wrong or any kind of morality and more concerned with realpolitik, with the potential political and military fallout. That's part of what's so fascinating about Napoleon. He's often right, but the reasons he's right aren't what we might expect. But his real concern here was that if his soldiers raped a bunch of women in Egypt, it would give the imams cause to call a jihad. His whole causus belli for the invasion was supposedly to liberate the people of Egypt from their Mamluk overlords. But that potential military and political fallout is really what concerned the powers that be in England, here in 1695. Now, we do have some details about what happened there on Ganji Sawai that day, but we're not going to go into it. I don't want to, and it's not really important. But it was an atrocity. There were nearly 300 pirates on board that day, and most of them not all, but nearly all of them, committed rape. Of the 600 passengers on board, we don't know how many were women of a desirable age, you know, not really, really young or really, really old. But it's very probable that every last one of them that falls into that group was raped on September 5th, 1695. And... Everybody at the time knew it. Once word got out and got back to England, this was not a secret. But the largest concern for the powers that be back in England, even beyond the mass rape and even beyond the mountains of treasure that they are about to carry away, was the fate of one woman on board. A fate that even today we can't exactly pin down. We don't know exactly who she was, even, most sources, the older sources, commonly refer to her as the Grand Mughal's granddaughter. This, whatever happened to her, has been pretty egregiously romanticized in some of those older sources, those that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. For example, in The Life and Adventures of Captain John Avery, Adrian von Broek writes, quote, Instead of ravishing the princess, which some accounts have made mention of, he paid the respect that was due her high birth, took her and her attendants to his own ship, and, after despoiling the vessel of all its wealth, 
suffered it and its crew to steer on to their intended port. End quote. Let them return home without the princess. This source is saying that he, well, not kidnapped her, not in this source, no, she was enamored with this dashing English pirate and willingly became his wife at Madagascar. And there they ruled as king and queen of the island. Now, none of that happened. But it was part of the core mythology of Henry Every for centuries. Daniel Defoe, in The King of Pirates, gives a different account. He writes, quote, When my men had entered and mastered the ship, one of our lieutenants called for me, and accordingly I jumped on board. He told me he thought nobody but I ought to go to the great cabin, or... At least, nobody should go there before me. For the lady herself and all her attendants was there, and feared the men were so heated that they would murder them all, or do worse. I immediately went to the great cabin door, and caused the cabin door to be opened, but such a sight of glory and misery was never seen by buccaneer before. The queen, for such she was to have been, was all in gold and silver, but frightened and crying, and at the sight of me she appeared trembling, and just as if she was going to die. She was, in a manner, covered with diamonds, and I, like a true pirate, soon let her see that I had more mind to the jewels than to the lady. The lady was young, and I suppose in their country esteem very handsome, but she was not very much so in my thoughts. At first, her fright and the danger she thought she was in of being killed taught her to do everything that she thought might interpose between her and the danger, and that was to take off her jewels as fast as she could and give them to me. And I, without any great compliment, took them as fast as she gave them to me and put them into my pocket, taking no great notice of them or of her which frighted her worse than all the rest, and she said something which I could not understand. I have read that it has been reported in England that I ravished this lady, and then used her most barbarously, but they wrong me, for I never offered anything of that kind to her, I assure you. Nay, I was so far from being inclined to it that I did not like her, and there was one of her ladies who I found much more agreeable to me, and who I was afterwards something free with, but not even with her either by force or by way of ravishing. We did indeed ravish them of all their wealth, for that was what we wanted, not the women. Nor was there any other ravishing among those in the great cabin, that I can assure you. As for the ship where the women of inferior rank were, and who were in number almost two hundred, I cannot answer for what might happen in the first heat. I have heard some of the men say that there was not a woman among them but that was lain with four or five times over, that is to say by so many several men. For as the women made no opposition, so the men took those that were next them without ceremony, when and where opportunity offered. End quote. And it goes on like that for some time. Now, I like Daniel Defoe. I think he's a good writer, and I think that makes for a good story. But here's the thing. There is an argument to be made that Henry Avery did not participate in this orgy of rape. He may have even tried to put a stop to it, but it was a futile attempt. There is some suggestion that... Well, the men were going to have their way, and they offered violence if Every tried to stop them. It's possible that Henry Every did protect one woman and her attendants. Now, this one woman was probably not the young and beautiful granddaughter of the Grand Mughal, but instead an elderly member of the Grand Mughal's court. At no point does any source I've read say that it was Aurangzeb's younger sister, but I've also not read any source that said it wasn't. And she is the most prominent elderly member of Aurangzeb's court. And she probably would have, at some points in her life, accompanied members of her family to Mecca. One of the Mughal historians who hated the English outside of this particular episode, but he hated them more for it, even he had to admit that this elderly member of the court, whomever she may have been, was protected from outright harm. 
on this cruise. But it's that bit about none of the other women in the great cabin were harmed that's just not true. Her younger relatives, her nurses, and all of the other women in her retinue were not protected. The scene there was no different than anywhere else on the ships. Rape and violence. And there's a bit in that passage from Defoe that says the women offered no resistance, and that, that's bullshit. Many of the women fought, and some of them even managed to escape their suffering, but not in a way that we might wish. They killed themselves. A large number of women, before the pirates had visited them, jumped into the water. Not with any hope of escape, there was no land in sight. They dove deep and they filled their lungs. They drowned themselves to escape the pirates. Others, especially of a higher birth, opened their own veins before the pirates arrived. Most of them were unable to avoid the pirates, but even some of those fought. There are accounts of several women on board who were actively being raped that grabbed the saber of the pirate and stabbed themselves through the heart. And you might think, why didn't they stab the pirate? But there were more pirates waiting behind him. It would have done them no good. This was the best way to escape and, in the culture of their time and place, to salvage some of their honor. It was, as we have said, barbarity. And this went on all night. Across all three ships, well, really just two ships. One of the vessels carried mostly supplies, very few passengers, crew and wood, water, and food. But one of the smaller craft, and Defoe even made mention of this, housed nearly all of the young women and girls who were not associated with the royal family, or otherwise of a higher birth. That means dozens of young women who were there essentially unprotected. Every pirate in the fleet made his way over to that ship, and it may have looked not unlike Defoe's description. Come morning, though, the pirates finally were sated, and they got back to work. They began the process of transferring all of the gold and the silver and the precious stones and the dyes and the spices and the silk and the slaves, which there were quite a few of. Nobody knows exactly how much was taken here. There are some estimates, and we're going to explore that next time, but to date, 1695, we can say with absolute certainty that this was the largest haul ever captured by pirates on the sea. But it was a huge prize, a mountain of treasure. It took them half a day or more to load it all on board their pirate ships. But eventually they did release the prisoners to their respective ships and allowed them to sail home to Surat. As you might imagine, upon returning to Surat, when everyone, including the Mughal, learned what had happened, it caused quite the uproar. The pirates sailed back to Madagascar, but they didn't stay long. They knew that there would be pirate hunters from Surat and other ports of India chasing them. Still, it was some weeks before England learned of what had happened. Among the very first people in England to learn of it was the king. A representative of the East India Company arrived, and it turned out that he had escaped, barely escaped with his life, the siege of Bombay that the Grand Mughal had ordered. They were at war with Mughal India. But William III acted fast. He was going to do everything he could to forestall further conflict. He drafted a letter to Aurangzeb guaranteeing him retribution. The men responsible would be captured and killed. Beyond that, King William III offered to pay losses in treasure and suffering to Aurangzeb. That is a chapter in and of itself. But at this moment, before the East India Company or the Royal Navy could mobilize, King William III needed a response. Something to show that he was serious and something that might actually get the job done. 
At that very moment, not entirely coincidentally, there was a delegation from New York City at court in London, and King William turned to that delegation. Indeed, there was a man among them who knew exactly how buccaneers operated, who personally knew Thomas too. Almost as soon as he learned what had happened in the Indian Ocean, William III signed a commission for Captain William Kidd to hunt these pirates down. For the past couple of episodes concerning the attack on the Mughal treasure ships Ganji Sawai and Fatah Muhammad, and the subsequent abuses of the people on board, we've been relying largely on the account of one man, thanks to the English grand jury literally throwing away the transcripts of the trial that gave the Englishman's account of the events on the day, we instead rely almost entirely on the records collected by a Mughal historian and journalist named Kafi Khan. I'm grateful that his account of the events exist, but what I wouldn't give to have some corroborating sources here. Kafi Khan is not at all an unbiased source. He hated the English, and you know, it's hard to blame him. England was in the process of a very slow invasion of India. Kafi Khan was of the opinion that the Mughal were the rightful foreign imperial overlords of the Indian people, didn't like that the English were moving in on their territory. His father had been an imperial historian that worked for the royal family, and Kafi Khan had aspirations to follow in his father's footsteps, but as yet he had not earned that distinction. He did work for the royal family as a, a messenger, which is nothing to scoff at, carrying the emperor's messages, but it wasn't what Khan wanted for himself. In his spare time, he was writing a comprehensive history of the Mughal Empire, which he did finish, and it's an excellent early source on their history. But it was not yet completed in September of 1695. At the time, he was on a mission for Aurangzeb, carrying letters and missives from the capital at Delhi to Surat, then he'd travel on to Bombay, where he'd have to deal with the uh, English, but then he'd go back to Delhi. While he was in Surat, though, rumors began to spread of an attack out on the ocean, and a few days later, a small group of haggard, damaged ships arrived there at port. One of them clearly belonged to the imperial royal family, and as representative of the emperor, he investigated and he was shocked at what he found. This is episode 223, Spoils. Ganji Sawai and her retinue arrived in Surat on September 12th, 1695, a week after Henry Every and the pirates let them go. Now, that would not normally have been a voyage of a week, but they were badly damaged. Kafi Khan took it upon himself to speak to the victims of the attack to gather evidence and take down their statements. We don't have those original statements, but we do have what Kafi Khan tells us about them. However, the picture he painted of what happened on the day of the attack is not 100% accurate. Naturally, as a good and patriotic Mughal correspondent, he was going to lie through his teeth about anything that made the Mughal Empire look even moderately bad. First, and the easiest to quantify for us, were the numbers of troops and the losses in battle. In Khan's version of the story, three very large English pirate ships arrived on the scene and bombarded the Ganji Sawai with overwhelming firepower. They were really just impressive titans of the sea that looked suspiciously like the East Indiamen that the East India Company uses in their trading fleets, my lord. Those three massive pirate ships vomited fifteen hundred wild-eyed barbarians onto the deck of Ganji Sawai, men who opened fire, killing in their opening volley almost exclusively women and children. At which point the two hundred brave defenders of the Mughal ship 
drew their swords and stood for a staunch defense. They held the line, they protected the civilians below decks, each man killed a dozen pirates or more. It was all dashing heroics, you know, men swinging from the rigging, fearful duels in which a single Mughal swordsman would parry five or six English blades at a time. Impressive stuff. And they would have won the day, but they were betrayed. Stephen Johnson characterizes Kafi Khan's assessment of Captain Ibrahim Khan as a debauched aristocrat. And I'm being a little bit hyperbolic about Kafi Khan's account of events on the day, but not too much so. I'll read a passage from Khan's account of what happened. He wrote, quote, The Christians are not so bold in their use of the sword, and there were so many weapons on board the royal vessel, that if the captain had made any resistance, they must have been defeated. But as soon as the English began to board, Ibrahim Khan ran down into the hold. There were some turkey girls he had bought at Mocha as concubines for himself. He put turbans on their heads and swords into their hands and incited them to fight. These fell into the hands of the enemy, who soon became perfect masters of the ship. End quote. Now this actually brings up a couple of things that I said about those slave girls. I told you that they were white Europeans, likely bought as an investment for sale in Surat. This account, who would know better, tells us that they were Turkish and bought as sex slaves for the captain. Now, I was working from a different account, a European account, which was also questionable. That account was probably trying to paint the captain in as bad a light as possible for a European audience manipulating the words of Kafi Khan to their own ends, but everyone, including this Mughal historian, is lying. They can't help themselves. It's all propaganda from all sides. When the stakes were as high as they were, when war seemed imminent, telling the truth was not an option. What's that Churchill quote? In time of war, the truth requires a bodyguard of lies. Kafi Khan goes on to tell us that only 25 Mughal soldiers died in the battle, while hundreds of Englishmen lay dead. This directly contradicts the account of another sailor, who we will talk about later, that says only one pirate died while dozens and dozens of Mughal soldiers lay dead. The numbers we discussed previously, a couple of hundred dead from all sides, comes from a consensus taken at the trial. But in Kafi Khan's version, despite the overwhelming prowess of the Mughal soldiers, the numbers of pirates were just too many. Combined with the cowardice of this debauched aristocrat, the ship did surrender. Now, very little of that assessment is really that accurate, given what we learn later, but what he talks about next is usually accepted as pretty hard fact. The bacchanal of murder and torture and rape that was to follow. Now, I'm not here to tell you that that didn't happen, but it is a bit suspicious that the only real record we have of that horrific event comes from a man who hated England with real passion. A man who was, and this is an important factor, actively arguing for a war with the English. With every opportunity he had, he would tell officials, you know, Sire, we need to go to war to push the heathens out of India once and for all. And this is the source that tells us that these Englishmen were guilty of mass rape. Now, I don't doubt in any way that there were abuses, many of them, heaped upon the people of the Mughal ships that were captured that day. All of them terrible, all of them criminal, but... Were they what Kafi Khan tells us they were? We might never really know. We do know that when the pirates who were allegedly part of that atrocity were tried for their crimes back in England, the jury found them not guilty. And then, any transcripts that might corroborate or contradict the story of Kafi Khan were destroyed by the government of England. 
Not only that, they were banned from public discourse. No one was to even discuss them in any kind of publication. They erased the words of the pirates, so the only account we have is that of a man who hated England. So on the one hand, you have the account of a man who very much wanted to paint the English in the worst light possible. On the other hand, from the English you get sort of an odd series of accounts. Stephen Johnson brings up a great point on this in regard to the sources in English. He writes in Enemy of All Mankind, quote, There is a strange reluctance in the literature of piracy to center the camera on these kind of offenses. Strange, because the literature is otherwise happy to feed you the gore and terror of the pirate's life in such intimate detail. If you want to read about Thomas II dying on board the Amity, holding his small intestines in his hand, there are a thousand pages in the archive that will give you that experience, uncensored. Gang rape, on the other hand, gets condensed down to a euphemism. The men dishonored the women. End quote. Now, the account of Kafi Khan is certainly flawed and propagandistic, but it's what we have. It may be sensationalized, it may even stretch the truth almost to breaking, but it is not a fiction. The pirates did torture, murder, and rape there on the Ganji Sawai, and of course steal, but what really matters isn't what the truth was, it matters what the truth was believed to be because that is what people reacted to. While Coffee Khan was busy gathering all of that testimony, the pirates who had perpetrated it were getting away. The day after the attack on September the 6th, 1695, the fleet began to reassemble. At least, the Susanna, under Captain Thomas Wake, arrived on the scene. He was a bit disheartened to learn that he'd missed out on the action. Now, the Amity did not arrive on the scene. She'd been badly damaged in the fight the previous day and headed back to Madagascar. But once they had the treasure all loaded up, the fleet ventured on to the coast of India. Now, we have one pretty good account of what happened there. It comes from a man named William Phillips, one of the pirates on board the Fancy, who later on would give a full confession. His account of the mutiny on board the Charles II gives us a lot of detail, really fleshes out what happened there. He doesn't, though, talk much about what happened during the battle for the Ganji Sawai. All he said there was, quote, When we were on board the Ganji Sawai, they being run into the hold, we called them up and gave them good quarter. We asked the captain what money he had on board, he told us he had one basket of about 2,000 pounds that belonged to him. The rest belonged to Turkish merchants, which we found in the hold. There might be, in the hole, about 150,000 pounds. End quote. A couple of notes there. When he says they were Turkish merchants, that's just what the Englishmen called them. They were Muslim Mughal Indians. And then... His account of the battle is very clipped. He doesn't go into any real detail. But I wonder why. It's possible that the interrogators who took his confession censored what he said. Or maybe it's because Phillips was trying to hide crimes which he had been actively involved in. Or maybe Coffee Khan was stretching the truth in his own account. Again, we don't really know, but this is another example of the inconsistencies about that day. And then... 152,000 pounds was a good haul at the time, but it was not even close to the whole take. That's just what they captured from the Gunsway in hard specie. Beyond that were gems and jewels and all manner of valuable trade goods. Goods that they would need to sell to turn into money, and the only place to do that was in India. So Phillips continues that they, quote, sailed all four together to Roger Poole. And he says that like it's a name, Roger Poole. But he means Rajapur. It reminds me of, well, if you think that the linguistic switch between Joli Rouge and Jolly Roger is a bit of a stretch, well, I'd invite you to visit Roger Poole, a town on the coast of India. Phillips goes on, quote, 
Roger Poole, about thirty leagues from Bombay, where we have an English factory. There we watered and shared the money. We gave Captain Wake no share, not being there and having taken a vessel by the way, and shared about one hundred pounds a man. End quote. There he's saying that the crew of the Susanna had made about one hundred pounds a man from another prize. But as that was the case, it was at this point that Susanna left the fleet and returned following the Amity to Madagascar. Phillips does not mention the trading of pirated goods they absolutely did there at Rajapur. There were certainly some unscrupulous merchants that bought a bunch of pirated goods and made a killing on it. He does go on to say that the pirates transferred a bunch of their silver into gold. They lost some money on those transactions, but the sheer amount of silver they would have had to carry around would be prohibitive. But it was at that point that things began to get a little bit tense among the crew. I told you that there was one source that calls out Joseph Pharaoh for his cowardice in the battle, one source that was there. This is that source. Phillips tells us that Every and his crew gave Pharaoh and his men a share of what boils down to the Fata Muhammad and one of the smaller ships sailing with Gunsway. But they did not share any of the spoils from Gunsway. Pharaoh and his men didn't fight for Ganji Sawai. And Phillips tells us that his men, quote, turned him out for a coward. Now, that might be in violation of their agreed-upon pirate code, or it might not. It depends upon whether or not Joseph Pharaoh really was a coward. Did he refuse to fight when he should have, or did the pirates of the fancy double-cross them? Did they purposefully misconstrue what had happened? Did they use their superior numbers to deny Pharaoh and his men a fair share of the plunder? After all, they were pirates. But the crew of the Fancy under Henry Every, and that of the Pearl under William Mason, and Phillips calls him Meese. This guy's recorded as Mace, Maze, Maze with a Z, Meese, and Mason. But still, Mason's crew and that of the Dolphin, which no longer existed and was on board the Fancy, they all got equal shares here. You know, more or less equal. Henry Every, as the admiral of the fleet and captain of the flagship, walked away with a full three thousand pounds sterling. The rest of the crew earned equal shares of about seven hundred pounds. Though in good pirate tradition, the officers and those who got wounded either got multiple shares or compensatory payment for their injuries. We still don't know exactly how much the pirates captured, in early September 1695. Estimates range from between about 200,000 pounds and 700,000 pounds. That's half a million in wiggle room there, so it's hard to say with any certainty. But regardless, this was a rich, rich prize. So where does Ganji Sawai, really all of the ships taken on September the 5th, where do they rank? in terms of prizes taken by pirates. You'll see articles like this pop up from time to time. What I will say with confidence is this. The prizes captured on September the 5th, 1695, including Fata Muhammad, Ganji Sawai, and the two ships accompanying her, was, up to this point here in 1695, the largest prize yet captured by a pirate in the Age of Sail on the sea. Now, we should talk about the caveats in that sentence. First of all, before the Age of Sail, there were some major prizes captured by pirates. The, uh, Cilician pirates, those that roamed the Mediterranean when Julius Caesar lived, they captured some really impressive ships. But for the Age of Sail the mid-1500s to about the mid-1800s, this is the largest prize yet taken on the sea. There are two occasions on which larger prizes were captured by privateer, buccaneer, pirate-ish people. 
but both of those were on land. First, there's Francis Drake's capture of the Spanish mule train at Nombre de Dios in 1572. Nobody knows how much he captured, but of course, he couldn't carry all of that silver to his ships. He had to bury a ton of it all around Panama and give a lot of it away to his Indian allies. The amount that he was actually able to carry home was a fraction of what he stole. And then there is what was probably the largest prize ever taken. That is Henry Morgan's sack of Panama in 1671. Now, that wasn't as large a haul as Morgan had hoped for. The Panamanians had put most of their treasures on a ship and sailed it deep into the Pacific. Morgan was never able to track it down. But he still carried away more money than anyone else ever had or probably ever would. Problem is, he had about 2,000 men with him. When they divided it all up, per man it was smaller than average. And then in the future, there are going to be two prizes that are going to give Henry Every here in September 1695 a run for his money. Both are large, and we'll talk about those when we get to it. There's an argument to be made that neither of them beat Henry Every's take here on this single day. However, when we consider their total career wealth, those pirates will have made significantly more than Henry Every. Still, though, for now, in 1695, Every is undisputably number one. It was a bit of vindication for Henry Every. He'd predicted that they would find the richest prizes in the world in the Indian Ocean. That's why his men and those other ships followed him. And they'd found the Ganji Sawai, a name that literally translates in English to exceeding treasure. Henry Every had been absolutely right. They had made more money than any pirates in history. Quite an achievement indeed. But all of that money and the abuses which had been heaped upon the victims did paint a target on the backs of the pirates, the largest target in the world. And the pirates knew it. Once they were done dividing up the loot, they scattered to the seven winds, as it's said. We're going to follow them next time. For now, I want to travel about 70 leagues up the coast of India to the port at Surat, to the East India Company factory there. And remember, in this context, a factory is really a uh, fortified base for the East India Company, including office buildings, a mansion for the president, bunkhouses, and actual factories. As well as prisons, they all had some cells inside. And in the prison there at Surat, a recent transfer from a Mughal prison had been shipped in. His name was Robert Culliford. He was one of the masterminds of the mutiny against Captain Kidd back in 1689. He sailed on board Blessed William and sailed alongside many of the men who had just attacked a Mughal fleet a few days back. And here he was in prison at the factory at Surat. But he wasn't alone here at the prison at Surat. James Kelly, another pirate who will soon become important, was at that same prison, and a bunch of other English pirates. It must have been a... You know, I, I was about to say a bit of a shock, but really it must have alleviated some of the boredom when, outside the walls of the factory there, arose a tumult. If Robert Culliford and James Kelly and the other pirates could see outside the walls from their prison cells, they would have noted a large crowd of angry protesters gathering. And when I say protesters here, don't picture hippies and don't picture picket lines. Instead, picture the Bastille, 1789. These people were here to do violence. The cause of their protest, really a mob action against the English East India Company, was the piracy so recently perpetrated by Englishmen against Mughal shipping and, of course, the violence done against their women. These people had been led to believe 
largely but not entirely by Kafi Khan, that somehow the English East India Company was to blame. Now, the governor of Surat, a Mughal official, did not need this headache. You know, he didn't like the East India Company either, but if they did wind up doing some damage or, God forbid, kill someone, it would mean real trouble between the company and his government. So he ordered a contingent of cavalry in to stabilize the situation. The president of the factory, an Englishman named Samuel Ansley, well, he wasn't exactly predisposed to let this cavalry detachment into his fortress, but he didn't have the power to refuse them. So he opened the gates. The Mughal cavalry dispersed the mob and marched in, for, you know, the protection of the English inside, obviously. Now, we might mock the English of the late 17th century for their habit of using phrases like Moorish or Turkish to mean any and all Muslim peoples. And rightly so, it's wrong, but the Mughal Indians were guilty of very similar things. For example, they confused, or maybe better to say combined, two words that were not really the same thing at all. English and pirate. They were one in the same to them. All Englishmen were pirates, and all pirates were Englishmen. You know, maybe some French or Dutch pirates were causing trouble, filthy Englishmen. In fact, there was a Dutch rover just a few years prior who had been causing them some trouble. Mughal authorities did finally capture him and bring him to trial. But the Mughal officials demanded that the English East India Company answer for his crimes. It was a whole thing. The Englishman would try to explain that, look, this guy's Dutch, we're English. And then the Mughals would turn around and be like, yeah, but your king is Dutch, so aren't you Dutch now? And they'd be like, well, yes, he is, but no, we aren't. It was, it was a problem. But that means that when Ansley heard about this piracy in the Indian Ocean, allegedly perpetrated by Englishmen, he knew immediately to bring all of his agents into the factory. Everyone out in the field was recalled. Now, a few of them didn't make it. Some Englishmen were caught out and killed out there. It became clear almost immediately that this situation was very dire. The mob was eventually dispersed, but should the Grand Mughal decide to move against the English East India Company, well, these men would be killed, probably by the cavalry that they let into their fort. And as soon as the Mughal heard what had happened, he did indeed move against the company, but not in Surat, in Bombay to the south, their center of power. We're talking about uh, an army moving against the company. Now, the president of that factory, kind of the head of the East India Company in India, a man named Sir John Gayer, wrote a letter to the governor of his province and to Aurangzeb. And it's worth quoting here. Geyer writes, quote, How often have we been falsely charged? Nay, how often hath it been proved so, and yet upon every fresh alarm of a pirate on the coast, all is still laid upon the English? Hath it not been sufficiently proved that that rogue that did so much mischief for two years, that Dutchman, all which was falsely charged on the English, was done by people of another nation and not the English? But of course he had to know that these pirates were Englishmen. He probably knew Henry Every's name. So he goes on, And we further say, suppose it should be proved there is English pirates in the seas as well as other nations. Is the English East India Company to be charged with their crimes? How unreasonable a thing would that be? Has not the great king of Hindustan he means Aurangzeb, many pirates on his own coast of his own subjects that robs and plunders the vessels of his own, as well as the subjects of others, notwithstanding all the care he takes to prevent it. He goes on, Can it be imagined, if we were guilty of such horrible crimes as is laid to our charge by vile and unreasonable men, as to rob the king's ships and bring their money so robbed to Bombay, that we should at the same time send a ship of so considerable cargo to be landed at the king's port 
he means Surat, and supply his subjects with so large a quantity of guns. End quote. There at the end he's making mention of a mission he did, a goodwill mission after news of Henry Avery's piracy had arrived, to arm the people of Surat against further piracies. His letter, I mean, it's mostly right, it makes good points all around, but it did no good at all. See, the Mughal officials there in India had a very strong piece of evidence against them. At least they thought so. They had in their possession a copy of an open letter written by Henry Avery himself, addressed to every Englishman in the world, announcing his intentions to attack Mughal shipping. To officials there in India, that's all the proof they needed, evidence of collusion, clearly. And it didn't help the case of the English that there were actually some privateers docked at the factory in Surat. Mostly they were Dutch, but the Mughals couldn't tell the difference there, and really they were only one step above pirates. A small step. They very nearly got caught up in this whole kerfuffle, too. Because within just a few days, the Mughals dropped the facade here. The Englishmen of the factory at Surat were arrested and put into chains and put into their own cells. One of those Dutch ships almost got seized, only barely managed to escape, and made her way to Bombay to inform the president of the factory there what had happened. Now, Geyer moved fast. He wanted to forestall any executions and therefore a probable war. He bought some time with a flurry of letters to men of import all over India, all of them basically saying, wait, stop, don't do anything rash, we can figure this out. I just need to talk to the king. You don't want a full-scale war here. Mughal officials made no move to provoke the English, but also no favorable response. They did not release those Englishmen in prison at Surat, and Geyer in fact had to smuggle one of his men out on one of those Dutch ships with orders to go to England and tell King William what was happening there. That mission would be a success, but for the moment, back in that cell in Surat, with Robert Culliford inside, one has to wonder, considering the limited number of cells in any one of these factories and the large number of men that were currently residing within, who might have been imprisoned close enough to Robert Culliford to talk a bit, have some conversations about their current situation and Robert Culliford's resume? We don't know anything here, officially speaking. Officially speaking, Robert Culliford would escape that prison in just a couple of months. Along with James Kelly and virtually all the other pirates who were there. I can't help but wonder, what if he didn't escape? What if Robert Culliford was set free? What if... Given the precarious position in which the East India Company found itself and the delicate diplomatic line they were forced to walk, unable to act in any kind of official capacity against the Mughal Empire, what if they decided that they needed a kind of private, secret, naval mercenary corps? Men who knew their business that would be based out of somewhere... Not too close by, maybe, I don't know, Madagascar. Men who would be able to prosecute a kind of shadow war against the Mughal navy. Led by a man who Captain William Kidd, who was beginning to outfit his ship for his journey to this region. A man that William Kidd personally hated. And that's where we're going to leave it today. Next time, we're going to visit St. Mary's Island off the coast of Madagascar and discuss the revolving door of pirates that were going to make their way to that island in the months to come. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show. All of our patrons on Patreon, everybody who has left us ratings or reviews, and everybody who has recommended this show. You all make it possible. Thank you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brilly. 
If you haven't checked them out yet, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.